Welcome, everybody, to the Creative Commons Summit. We're thrilled uh, that you're here and thrilled that you're here at this session. Uh, the title of this session is Edutainment, Open Pedagogy, and Empowered Learning. My name is Cable Green. I'm the Director of Open Education at Creative Commons. And today, my role is to be the moderator of this fabulous panel that we have here uh, in front of us. And uh, what I will encourage all of you to do in the audience is as the panelists are speaking, think about questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. I will gather all of those questions. And after they are done going through some slides and some discussion, uh, we will uh, field those, uh, those questions to the panelists. Uh, with that, let me ask uh, our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we're, let's start with uh, Esther, and then we'll go Ari, and then Carissa, and then uh, Gibran. So Esther, over to you. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, needless to say, I'm really excited and thrilled about this 20th anniversary um, because I was part of Creative Commons for so many years, and this is something that we dreamed about. Um, so I've been a teacher for 40 years. Yeah, probably most of you weren't even born then. And um, I also co-founded this company, Track.app, with my former student, Ari Memar, who will be probably next to speak. And we're really excited to empower kids. And we're using a lot of the OER that I worked on early on. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention I was chair of Creative Commons a few years there and it was been it's been an exciting journey. So thank you so much for joining. And now over to Ari. I'll make it super quick. I am the CEO and co-founder of Tract. My name's Ari. I was Esther's former student at Palo Alto High School. And now we're on this new journey together. And I'm excited to share a bit more about how we are using uh, the amazing open education resources that are out there. Hi everyone, my name is Carissa Cabrera. Um, I'm a marine biologist and tract creator who helps support this amazing platform with uh, OER informed resources about our oceans and the planet. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Gibran. Um, I'm a musician, producer, I was also a music professor, worked in the music industry for a while. And yeah, I'm a music creator at Tract. Um, yeah, it's been a really great time creating awesome content on this app. All right, so why don't I jump in? I'm gonna do a few slides and uh, excited to share a bit more. So let me give you a little bit of, you know, what is Tracked before we get started and explain how we're leveraging the open education resources. So we've kind of noticed all of us that kids want to be YouTubers and vloggers when they grow up. It's literally the number one thing kids want to be when they grow up. And a lot of what you actually see happening on TikTok or YouTube is kids teaching kids, but it lacks substance and structure to make it educationally valuable. So you can think of Tract as combining the good parts of what you see on, you know, creating video content and being a creator, but also bringing with it the structure and research a project-based learning approach. So on track, kids are creating and taking project-based video classes from each other. Esther and I just gave a quick intro, but I think the, the nice part about uh, working with your former teacher, besides being able to tell her what to do, is taking all the wisdom from the 40 years that she spent in the class and also bring with it a lot of new ideas uh, my background's in technology. I worked at Uber for years. I was in product and operations. And so it's fun to bring these kind of two different worlds together in new media and technology with education. Um, I don't think Esther needs an introduction here and it would probably take a long time, but Esther, do you want to share a little bit more about kind of yourself and your, your philosophy as so a teacher? My philosophy is right here in this quote when you put students in charge of their education, there's no limit to what they can achieve. So that's what I did in my classes. That's why they grew from 20 kids in 1984 to over 700 and five other teachers in 2020. And it's kids love to be in charge. Kids love freedom. And actually, if you just think about it, your ancestors also love freedom or they wouldn't have come to America. So, Thank you for putting this quote. And I think that's something we should all think about 
especially as education is being reconstructed at the moment. So I was going to attempt to try to do a live demo on a platform I'm not that familiar with, but for the, the safety of our audience, I'm going to attempt to do a screen share instead, which feels a lot lower risk. Uh, and this will give you a quick uh, demo of how Tract works. It'll be about two minutes. When students log into Tract for the first time using their educator code, they'll land on our homepage. Here they'll find the first actions they can take to get started. The main thing students will be able to do on Tract is take and make learning paths. Learning paths are project-based, self-directed video courses. These can be made by students by browsing our Creator Academy and taking our How to Create a Learning Path, or you could start by having your students take learning paths created by other students. We have them all organized by category so students can browse what interests them. Some may already know what they like in our search bar and search for their favorite, like Harry Potter. Once you find something that you like, you can click into it and get more details. Here, you'll find a trailer to give you a quick overview of what you'll be learning. You'll get more details on the creator, the student teacher behind this awesome learning path. You'll also get a sense of any supplies that are needed and the steps along the way to complete this project. All of the videos you'll see are in this YouTube TikTok style aesthetic that's really fun for kids. But you'll notice everything is active, not passive. So students will progress through each mission of the learning path and be able to share their reflections via reflection questions, their progress via project checkpoints, and finally, a capstone project. As they progress through the missions, they'll be awarded coins. These coins will be awarded just for participating, but also be awarded for outstanding creativity and quality. Our incentive mechanism awards coins proportionally with the level of effort that students have put in. So you earn the most coins by collecting the most awards, which you can only do by spending time and quality into your projects. So let me get back to the, the slides now. Hopefully that gave you a little kind of inside glimpse of what the platform looks like. But for me, what's really exciting is when you look at what's out there that kids are consuming, you know the, the bar for entertainment and engagement just keeps being raised. You look at the gaming world, you look at the media world, things are getting more and more entertaining and attention spans are going lower and lower and lower. What we have available to us in terms of these incredible educational resources that have been built in this community now needs an execution on the delivery side that can meet students at this level of entertainment and engagement value, but also that leverages that, that desire for freedom of choice and empowerment. And so I think what is exciting for me is to see, you know, how can we take that energy that kids have and apply it towards something educationally valuable and productive? And what better demonstration of understanding than teaching? And what better way to find new topics that interest you than from a role model or a near peer that you can really relate to, who's a great storyteller, who's a great teacher, and who's someone that inspires you. And so I think, you know, in this world of, you know, rapidly posting new content and information and fake news, creating and supporting, you know, creators of substance who are researching and teaching in a really productive way is so, so important. And you really can't do that unless you have a strong foundation that they can pull from. So with that, I want to hand it over to Carissa, who's one of our fantastic creators, to walk through how she actually takes the OER resources and turns them into track classes. Thanks, Ari. So as Ari mentioned, this there's such a need for self-directed um, learning resources for students. And because of that need, there needs to be options um, for students on track, which is where all the creators come in, like me. So I mentioned in my introduction that I focus a lot on science, ocean literacy, environmentalism, and there needs to be many options for students to find their corner of interest when it comes to those topics. And none of the learning paths that I create for Tract would be possible without um, open education resources that 
creators are supported with when they're creating learning paths for the first time. And um, as Ari also highlighted and is really a huge pillar of why track has been successful is that students need things to be fun and they need it to be relatable and fast paced and efficient because it's how students are learning these days. And so the open education resources are really helpful for me when I'm creating these learning paths because they're legitimized and I can help uh, make them a little bit more modern. And a great example is the one that we see on the slide now, which was about sharks. So I used um, an OER to help me write my script about sharks to teach students the importance of them in an ecosystem and why they might be threatened with extinction. And I was able to have confidence that the script I was writing was accurate, which is a huge consideration as you're putting content out onto the internet and also engaging because kids right now are on TikTok and they're looking for a, you know, more the edutainment method that Tract is showing in the space right now. And it can be hard to ask teachers to take all these resources and, um, on their own time, make them engaging and exciting. That's a lot to ask, especially outside of their working hours after they're doing so much more. And so this is a really supportive tool for creators on track to help create their learning paths. And it's a way to make it useful and interesting, but also accurate, especially with science-based le lessons where you wanna make sure you're giving them the best information to the students in the best way. And so I'm just one example of a creator on track who focuses on the environment. We have so many different types. And Gibran is a more creative musician-based creator who still uses OER Commons for his his learning scripts too. So do you want to tell us a little bit about them, Gibran? Absolutely. Thank you, Carissa. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, again, I'm a music creator on Tract. Um, and Tract has allowed me to create fun project-based content uh, using OER for music and other things. And I, I first began writing my scripts um, using a lot of um, music experience, but a lot of uh, OER resources uh, in music. So as you see this example on my slide, uh, I created an intro to piano course uh, using the National Association for Music Education, which is a uh, OER. Uh, just, I believe sometimes, uh, even as a kid when I was studying music, music theory and education can be a little bit blah sometimes. So in a lot of my content, I incorporate, you know, funny videos, GIFs, uh, and engaging visuals to capture the learner's attention. Um, and it, it helps them learn an education of, educational value of the material. Um, so I think that's just super important. Uh, and I also use like motion array to incorporate like licensed music uh, and videos on my path, uh, again, to get that very fun edutainment, which we keep mentioning. Um, so the learners really get a good experience. Uh, also a very cool fun fact, I actually did a learning path on Creative Commons, uh, just giving learners a grasp of that side of licensing, utilizing OER for education, and then also some um, some tips for artists and creators and things like that. So um, it's very rewarding and fun, you know, you know, using these resources and um, teaching these students to, you know, things that they might have been bored in the classroom and really changing that into a fun, engaging uh, experience for them. So. Yeah, nice speaking everyone and I'll pass it back to Ari. As we wrap up, uh, just wanted to give a, you know, an invitation to anyone in the audience who does want to give Track to Try, uh, you know, free to all educators. Um, you can visit teach.track.app and use the code Creative Commons and you can explore, look around and see what Chris and Gibran have been up to. And hopefully your students as well can leverage the uh, incredible content library that's been built and the vehicle for researching, finding, and sharing their own lessons using the open education resources that are out there. So I will stop my screen share. I see there's some, some chatter in the chat uh, and turn it back to Cable to see uh, which questions we should go after next. Great, thanks, Ari. 
Uh, yeah, you've got uh, two questions so far. Let me just remind the audience, go ahead and type your questions in the chat and we will get to each of them in turn. Uh, so the first question, uh, it says, it looks like a find and reuse OER content model. Uh, how is the OER content found uh, for use in, in Tract? Uh, is there a repository, database, et cetera? The two examples we've seen use commercial sources, Harry Potter and JAWS. Uh, how does that work? And I think uh, you know what this what uh, Stephen might be asking here is those are all rights reserved, copyright, and probably not openly licensed. Uh, so how how does that work with uh, with Tract? Yeah, so I can take the first bit of it, and then Esther, if you want to take the second bit of it, uh, I would say OER Commons is probably the biggest repository that we would find most things from. Um, and then I would say on the commercial pieces, that's where it's kind of the fair use execution where just a little bit of it, uh, not too much of it, educationally relevant, that has kind of found general acceptance. Uh, but certainly uh, if you were using, you know, Harry Potter brand and likeness and selling, uh, you know, knockoff made in China, uh, paraphernalia, that would probably not be okay. So I think that luckily there's been enough kind of room in the in the fair use uh, kind of legal case to kind of protect us there. Esther, do you want to add any more context yeah. on the, the searching and the licensing? Right. So I do think it's all based on fair use because we don't use very much. We just use a couple of images or a few things. And actually that gives publicity to the um, the or origin of the the videos so you know they, they want to go and see more harry potter or whatever um what we're doing is using that basically as a way to teach kids what i call the four c's which are the most important things in education and that's communication collaboration critical thinking and creativity those are the four things that everything we're doing is based on and that has an educational outcome um, so I think that there isn't a real problem with licensing. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question we had is from uh, from Vahid. He says, are the paths, uh, the, tra the tracked paths that you talked about that reuse OER is also CC licensed? Uh, they are not specifically CC licensed. So right now the the way i think of the like infrastructure and then the layer on top of the infrastructure is we we want to support a vibrant ecosystem of sharing of educational resources and facts and i think that's the base layer all of us should pull from and that's the base layer we do pull from as well on top of that that's where a lot of the storytelling and uniqueness and uh, adaptation to certain communities come in. So in our context, our community is a community of kids teaching kids, and it's not easily made uh, publicly available and interactable because there's a lot of kid-specific content and kid-specific information. And so we try to keep that more uh, within the application and within that community, um, but we would love anyone to have access to all the information we have access to and you know provide their own stories and context and placement uh, so that's kind of the way you know we've thought about it but we're we're young and open to new ideas and ways to do things so if you feel like there's a elegant execution of uh, licensing those accordingly like we're we're, we're definitely interested well, it's funny you should mention that. That's one of the things that Creative Commons does is work with organizations to help you do exactly that. So good conversation for us to have uh, after. We can, happy to have you. Carissa, did you want to jump in? I see you leaning on the edge of your chair. Um, I just saw another question in the chat that was saying, um, it's an amazing resource for learners. What are the terms for kids creating content? And uh, Esther and Ari's, um, foundation for Tract was peer-to-peer -peer learning. And so 
creators range in age. And while me and Gibran have experience teaching, there's also a lot of opportunities for young um, students who maybe were on the other side of track to join the creator side of track and learn how to make their own learning paths and then get experience teaching so that they can become masters of the topic that they're teaching on. And so while not all content is teacher made. Yeah, and just to elaborate on that point, I think the, the way we structure any sort of you know, community of teachers is we want people looking up to people that aren't too far ahead of them, but are clearly role models and experts and just a level ahead of them. And so, you know, when you're talking to creator and when you're talking to creators like Chris and Gibran, they're some of our best, most polished, most researched, most skilled uh, teachers. And for a lot of younger students, let's say you're 10 years old or 11 years old, that there may be a distance there between what you're capable of and what they're capable of. So it totally makes sense that when you're starting your journey as a student teacher, uh, that that bar shouldn't be quite as high and that you should find an audience within your classroom and within your school. Obviously a, a smaller audience, but a local authentic audience. And so that's where we'd see, you know, students that have no experience uh, in teaching or content creation start. But the nice part is uh, you don't have to end there. So as you do really well, uh, you can teach students from beyond your classroom and beyond your school. And if you do even better, then you can actually get paid uh, and teach kids all around the world. So that's kind of the structure uh, we've built with those steps along the way. So you can see uh, what you need to do to make it to the next uh, step. Great, thank you. Uh, there are, I, I'm looking at all the questions. I'll, I'll summarize them in a couple of themes here. Uh, one of the, a couple questions get at the question of sustainability of, of Tract as an organization. Uh, and some side questions in there if you're using uh, non-commercial CC license content, if you're a commercial entity, et cetera. Um, and then there's another uh, couple questions that get at this idea of uh, contributing back to the commons. So you've given some good examples of how you're reusing OER uh, from OER commons and some other sources. Um, are there, are there uh, active things that Tract or Tract's users are doing uh, to contribute back, maybe CC licensing works that they're producing uh, and contributing back to the wider commons. Yeah, so let's take those one at a time. So on the first one of the financial uh, sustainability, uh, I think we're amongst friends. We're early, like the company is very, very young. So I think the biggest risk in any new company is building something that nobody wants and nobody uses. And so we're more focused on making sure that's not the case. Uh, and I don't think it's the case. Uh, and so for us right now, it's really having more positive interactions with teachers and students and improving our execution such that kids are having an incredible time, they're learning and teachers feel well supported and feeling like they're getting time back and they're having better outcomes. So that's kind of the near term focus. And that's why, you know, when you start a business, if you can bring in some investment that gives you a little bit of breathing room so you can do exactly that. Over time, obviously we'll need a, uh, you know, a financial model to sustain what we're doing. I think at that point, there's a lot of different options we can look at, whether it's uh, through districts or through parents or through corporate sponsors, uh, but that just hasn't been a near term priority for us uh, as a very, young uh, upstart company. Um, and then I think the second question was on mechanisms for giving back. So I'm totally open to ideas on like, if we could give back in like one way, what would be the best way to give back? Um, I've thought we could either one, uh, financially give back. We have a, a mechanism within our uh, motivation system where students are earning coins and one of the options can certainly be for students to give back those coins uh, via a monetary donation to Creative Commons. Uh, another option would be uh, to actually contribute uh, uh, you know primary research and resources of our own. Um, because of the makeup of our organization today we are leaner on teachers and heavier on creators. So we're definitely like a net 
uh, taker versus contributor. Um, but I think as we expand and have our own, you know, internal, um, you know, larger education arm, that becomes a bigger and bigger portion of what where we can help. Um, but overall, I think you know these are a lot of like really good questions, and I would be, you know, not like authentic if I was representing a level of like understanding of how to answer these questions with like a really like ironclad bulletproof answer. So I would actually turn this back around to you and say, it sounds like you have great instinct on what we should do. I would love your feedback and we'd love to kind of incorporate that. Yeah, and as I said, you know, we should, I, this is uh, begging another conversation uh, between Creative Commons and Tract in the future. Yeah. We should, we will set that up and have those conversations. Uh, and the, you know, the answer is there are a lot of uh, models that different organizations uh, have engaged in and uh, there are multiple paths in fact, uh, Creative Commons wrote a book called Made with Creative Commons, and it was <laughs> showing lots of different business models of how, uh, how people engage uh, CC licensed works, uh, and in some cases, uh, give the works away for free and sell services around them, and lots of different uh, models that, that affect sustainability uh, while uh, maintaining the, the mission and the ethos of, of the organization and the commons. And so, yeah, longer conversation, probably not for today. Um, let me ask a question that as we were all talking and preparing for this panel uh, came up, um, I think Esther might have said it, you know, one of the challenges of, of open educational resources is oftentimes they're created and then they kind of sit, right, and they get out of date. Uh, and they might be openly licensed, but maybe they're, you know, maybe they're six, seven years old and they really could use a refresh. Um, could you talk maybe a little bit about how uh, Tract helps students and and teachers keep uh, openly licensed resources applicable and relevant for the current landscape that students are learning in? So um, can I answer that, Ari? Yeah, of course. I think you're probably the best equipped. <laughs> okay, so, you know, my goal with this, in, with Tract has been to be able to allow kids that are just a little bit older to help kids that are just a little bit younger. So I found after all those years of teaching that in the classroom, the most influential person for a student is a child that is just a little older. So it's peer to peer learning. And that is pretty much what we're trying to do. And we're going to be offering this to teachers. So at teachers in high school, I should say, we're already offering it to them, but we're gonna focus more on giving them a platform where their kids can share with other kids. So why would you do that? The answer is, if you look at leadership training, you see the most critical part of leadership training is being able to teach. And so this gives kids an opportunity online to teach each other. And there is no other place to do that. And they can use, um, you know, OER, they can use things they create themselves, they can use whatever they want, or whatever the teacher says they should do. But it's an opportunity to recreate a peer to peer in class, or maybe now online program for kids to learn to be leaders and to think. And as I said, the four C's are one of the main focuses. How do you communicate in the 21st century? You know, if I just think about when I was a child, the only way you communicated was, you know, you wrote it down on a piece of paper and you read books and you listened to teachers. But today is very different. So that's what we're trying to do. And I want to include everything from Creative Commons. I would like to see our students contribute to the to Creative Commons and to the to all the uh, resources that are offered. But as Ari said, we're very young. Literally, we've been started doing this in March, and I think it's September right now. So we're not a big group, even though, even though it looks like what we're doing is pretty incredible, which it is. We have amazing creators. And, um, and so that, that's the goal, providing this platform for kids to learn to teach each other, learn the skills that are necessary for the 21st century. And we welcome your feedback and your suggestions on how to do this. And, and, and I was gonna say, Esther, specifically on the question of like 
how do you prevent, you know, shorter half-lives or like aging of what, you know, content is available? I actually look at it slightly differently, which is in a lot of cases, the actual research and the content like is accurate and ages pretty well. And in some cases, you know, there's new research that will come in that is an extension or builds off of, you know, what was maybe prepared five years ago or 10 years ago. Now, the hard part is the, the changing of like preferences and pop culture and what's interesting and what's trending and what's topical and what's relatable for someone's local context, that is way, way more dynamic. So that is moving at a very, very fast speed. So in my mind, like if there are good resources that are prepared that actually don't require that, that fast of an update, uh, that is, that's totally fine. I mean, it, it can be on a slower cadence of being enriched or modified. What needs to move faster is the translation layer of you actually taking the resource and then applying it to an execution that works best for that student in your classroom. So that, that's kind of the way I would think about it. A lot of what we use is stuff that was made, you know, five plus years ago, and it has actually aged like a fine wine. It's like, excellent. It, it looks great. <laughs> Right. You know, I see in the chat here something about LOL cats. I don't know what that is. Do you know, Cable? What are they talking about? Uh, LOL is laughing out loud. Uh, they're uh, they're laughing? talking about, you know, the, the meme of cats sharing cats on the Internet, I think. They're having some fun. Okay. Well, I mean, I will check out their cats. <laughs> I actually, I have a, I have a question. Um, uh, this will be my selfish question as moderator. Uh, I have, uh, I've been talking for a few years, um, and I'll share a link here to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I've been talking and thinking for several years about how can, what's the connection and potential connection between different sectors of open, open access research, open educational resources, uh, open pedagogy that you all have been talking about, uh, open science principles, open data, et cetera. What's the, uh, what's the connection between those areas of open and coming up with solutions for the world's greatest challenges, which I would argue the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, do a pretty good job mapping out what those goals are. And so, uh, you know, we've talked about everything from uh, creating open educational resources uh, that world's education institutions can use around the SDGs. And there's actually a big UN project called the SDG Academy, uh, which uh, was all free and Creative Commons worked with them. And now all their content is both free and open. So it's CC licensed. Um, and that's a good first start. Um, and the, But the reason I'm asking here, and Carissa, maybe I can direct this to you because uh, you're in marine biology. And as I look at the sustainable development goals, you know, number 14 here, is life below water, right? That's one of the major uh, challenges uh, in the world. There's a direct link to that SDG. Um, you know, what, what role do you think learners might have as they're learning, um, uh, as, they're, as they move from uh, K-12 and, and primary education up to secondary and tertiary education? Uh, what role can open pedagogy, students getting their hands on the content, being creators of knowledge, as Esther said, working with their peers to come up with uh, not just generating con content, but in the context of SDGs, actually learning about the world's biggest challenges and then coming up with, you know, potentially, hopefully, solutions to those challenges as they're learning. You know, what, what role do you see, maybe in marine biology, that, you know, tools like Tract and other forms of open pedagogy uh, where students can actually become part of that process, and what does that do to their learning? Is that is that motivating? Is it is it not? What what are your thoughts on that? That yeah, that's a wonderful question, Cable. I'm love it, Cable. That's that that wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, one thing that maybe we didn't highlight completely is that you know each learning path has missions that students are able to participate in. Um, that are project-based um, missions. And so whatever age the student on track is, they are able to participate in 
a project related to the learning path, so say it's related to the ocean, that helps get them creative thinking, critical thinking, and solution-based thinking. And I focus on a solution-based approach for teaching. And one of the reasons why I moved out of academia and scientific research and into conservation education was for exactly the reasons that you just highlighted, Cable. So, um, you know, when it comes to the SDGs, I believe that service learning projects are one of the pillars to help get people involved in um, accessible education. Tracked right now is free for students. And to be honest, from the perspective of a marine biologist, we need everyone participating in solutions. And I'm sure that anyone who's working at any pillar of the SDGs recognizes that we need everybody working in every pillar, right? And so instead of putting this on the teachers to create this innovative, to take time out of their day to focus on a topic that they're not experts in because students need to learn about it, it should really be deferred to a more creative mechanism that's more modernized. And so um, anyone who's on TikTok or YouTube sees that students wanna learn about these topics in a fun way, Tract is just now providing the resources to do that. Um, I think that the earlier you start, the better for students, especially when it comes to participating in climate action and environmental projects. And hopefully, you know, the work that they do on Tract in these learning paths maybe opens the conversation for them to talk to their families or their friends and say, hey, I want to actually go volunteer in my community now. And kind of the natural extension as they develop their interests through the open education resources and are, and then they're able to discover what they're most passionate about and then as they grow up and develop they can pursue those passions outside of the internet and also online that was a great answer carissa and i just want to say as a teacher you present a lot of information in class and you want students to come and to do something with that information and frequently there is no doing with that information there's like it's there's a dead end and we're providing an opportunity for people, for kids to do something with the information that they just got. And, you know, if you guys have more suggestions for learning paths that, you know, we might, might want to undertake, especially related to the UN Sustainable Goals, we would love to hear that. And um, I just remember when I gave that talk years ago in Italy to the UN and talked about things like that, it was a big eye opener for all of them. They were kind of like, oh my God, what is that teacher talking about? But now here we are today, 2021. And um, I think we're, that's why we're celebrating. I mean, it's the 20th anniversary. So many good things have happened as a result of all our efforts over the years. And I think that Tract can help promote action in a lot of the things that people are just talking about and then not doing. Yeah, and I think as with any sort of, you know, discovery mechanism of new uh, resources, like clearly, if you look at the OER world, you know, filtering by grade level or common core standards or whatever it may be, I think that's the more typical uh, discovery mechanism. But I think there's more and more of a groundswell of people now trying to find ways to integrate the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so you're seeing elementary school teachers, you're seeing middle school teachers, high school teachers, finding ways to kind of weave that into the curriculum and their classroom experience. So I think that's that's definitely like an area of need to broaden uh, kind of the tool set available for teachers and content creators to make sure the most accurate, best information and facts are being presented. And, you know, from my own personal experience, like I wish I was introduced to this stuff earlier, because I think if you're introduced to these problems earlier, you can't ignore them and they're going to drive how you spend your time, especially if they're presented in a way that's really compelling. And you talk about, you know, kids being exposed to certain videos or documentaries, and then all of a sudden, like they're gonna go and, and start, you know, some community movement. And so these kind of, th these kind of things are real, um, but I do think we can do probably a better job of building the, the ecosystem of resources for all the teachers out there who do want to start integrating them in the easiest way. Thanks, Ari. A uh, new question came in. Uh, Cheryl from Arizona says, so the missions are collaborative for students? 
question mark. Uh, can you show an example, please? Uh, yeah, so let me see if I can really quickly pull up something that I can show in real time. But what I would say is collaborative in the sense that a lot of times your demonstration of understanding through your project is a project that you work on with someone else. So maybe you've made a video game with someone else. Uh, maybe you've actually uh, done research and created a video kind of sharing your research with someone else. Um, we kind of see this naturally where we don't, we don't tell people like you have to work with someone else, but I think naturally when students are in a classroom, like they want to work with other people. So that kind of happens naturally. And there's always this element of, you know, peer influence where someone's doing something that looks cool. So like you want to participate in it. Uh, so I think that that can work really positively, but I'd say most of the, you know, demonstrations, uh, project demonstrations tend to be, you've made something with digital tools like videos or digital art or, uh, you know, games via coding, um, or you've, you know, written something um, and you do that with, you know, your classmates. So let me see if I can really quickly find something to share, I'll do that. Otherwise, uh, I would encourage you to sign up and log in and see all the amazing things that are in the platform. Well, Ari, right, while you're looking, I'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Are there topics that you all wanted to discuss which we haven't gotten to yet? We still have a few minutes. Well, I think I'll just say one thing and then I'll let Chris and Gibran talk as well. I think one thing that I was really struck by the kids was that we have a prize board and the prizes were typical kid prizes to start, um, you know, games and candy or whatever. And it switched and it switched to UN sustainable goals. And the number one thing that kids were donating or using their prize points for was a meal for a kid that didn't have a meal. And this was all kid directed. I mean, and so we put that on there because kids really care about other kids. And they also cared a lot about what we're doing to clean up the beaches and what we're doing with the whole climate issue. So that also ties into the collaborative stuff. None of us can do it alone. This is the idea of we have to work together to make this, all the goals that we have happen. And it, it's not gonna happen if one person, of course, if one person donates meals, okay, one kid eats, but we have to have a lot of kids doing this. And like I said, we didn't push it. The kids pushed it themselves, which just should tell you something about this generation that's coming up. I, I was really impressed. Yeah, kind of going off what Esther just highlighted, um, I see it every day. Um, students specifically under the age of 18 are feeling a lot of um, weight and ownership over current environmental challenges that we're facing. And they want to be part of the solution. They just don't know how. And so this could be for anything that they're passionate about. So while we're talking about it in the context of the SDGs, it can also be about creativity and marketing and business and music. And so the, there's a need for mentorship and it might be something that's lost uh, as we've transitioned to virtual learning. And I think that what Tract is trying to do is bring that relationship back so that students know that there's someone that they can look to for guidance and also for inspiration. Yeah, and to add what Chris is saying with the mentor, um, I think, you know, when, when learners look at me and Carissa, we're, we're very, we had a lot of, we have a lot of, of experience in our fields. Um, you know, for, for instance, me, I've, I've drummed with Grammy winning artists, went on tour and they're like, okay, I want to learn music from that guy, you know? So we have a very unique approach and kids are just, all the time asking us questions and we're giving them advice and things like that, but we're, we're teaching them ways from someone in that, you know, and then we're, we're almost their mentor. Um, and then even other creators that join that are a little bit younger than us, um, we help them out with that, but um, it's great. And going back to the collaboration part, 
um, like Ari said, it's, it's almost in the classroom. It almost naturally happens when um, they're using the track app. Um, for instance, the other day there was a um, a bunch of kids were submitting to my path, and even I heard my voice in the background from another student. So they're all kind of collaborating with each other in a way, um, you know, that was super unique and fun um, when they're learning something at the same time. So very rewarding. And Ari, did you find the example you wanted to show? Yeah, I did. Let me, yeah, let me quickly uh, get this going real quick. Yeah, so as an example, you know, this is something that Jabron and others have helped you know, work together with some of our additional creators and student and student teachers. Uh, you can see here a lot of different, you know, feedback and perspectives. And this is really like the groundwork for how we support new student teachers. So they learn the whole process of, you know, identifying a topic that they're interested in, researching the topic, outlining it, and ultimately recording video, recording, editing, and publishing their first lessons. So starting with really no prior knowledge or experience. And typically they'll do that together with other students and then they'll see how, you know, the students that came before them have done it as well. So very much this kind of this, this cycle of, you know, learn from the people who came before you, but also, you know, do it with the, the, the folks around you. Uh, do we provide tech assistance to people who want to be content creators? Yes, we do. And we yeah. do delighted to have more content creators that we can help train. And uh, so we, what we're trying to do is help kids promote things that they care about and that matter in the world today, such as the SDGs and so forth. So whatever we can do and whatever you would like to suggest would be great. Esther, I really liked what you said before about uh, the, the kids care and Moreover, that they they learn best when they're working on things that they care about. <laughs> so, um, as open pedagogy started to emerge, um, you know, over the past well <laughs> decade in the open education space, um, you know, one of the things I kept doing was checking in with our children uh, who are now older. They're in high school and eighth grade, eleventh grade, and eighth grade. Uh, but at the time, this was probably five years ago, I asked our youngest, uh, what was your best learning experience? Like you've had, you've been in school a long time. What was your absolute favorite? And without even thinking about it, uh, Casey says, uh, well, my, my science teacher took us on a field trip and we went to a local stream and we took samples out of the water. And then we went back to our classroom in our little lab and we figured out what impurities were in the water. And we figured out that when they put that new asphalt road in, that some chemicals that are bad for the salmon ended up in the water. And this is a salmon run because we live near the Puget Sound. And, uh, and that's bad for the fish. And so I need to figure out how can I, you know, uh, collect this data and give it to the state EPA. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're in the seventh grade, you know, <laughs> what are you doing? And it, it was amazing. And the class submitted their data to the state EPA and they got a nice letter back that basically said, uh, we, the state EPA, don't have the resources to go out in all these small streams. And we really appreci appreciate you being citizen scientists. And uh, you know this, the fact that he was in this and, and his classmates and his teacher were in this uh, authentic, it was, it was a real environment, it mattered and it was meaningful, right? Like he cared about the fish um, and he didn't like the streams in our neighborhood being polluted by new roads that were going in. And I think that that's, um, I mean, Esther, you know, my doctorate's in education psychology, like how people learn really matters. <laughs> and that's when we, right. When we're engaged, when when students are able to engage like they can in Tract and other and other tools to co-create, and when they're working on things like SDGs, um, learning it's a whole different environment. Like it takes it to a whole new level. It's very exciting. Well, thank you for giving that example. I think that's a hundred percent accurate. You're right. And one of the reasons, as I said, that program of mine, the journalism program, grew to be the largest in the country 
was because of exactly that. Kids were working on projects they cared about. In this case, they were writing things and publishing, but as long as they're working on something they direct, they care. And, um, and I think we need to incorporate that more into schools. I mean, in today's world, I can say that it's gotten actually worse because everybody's worried about what they call the learning loss. And I was like, oh my God, please help us. Because that means more direct instruction, more memorization, more disgruntled kids. Can we just calm down and stop forcing kids to memorize? And uh, so this is an attempt to make learning real for kids. And on, re on the real world and in a way that they want to learn. So um, yeah, whatever suggestions you have would be great. I know the Creative Commons community is super smart. I mean, I've been involved for all those years and I've always appreciated hearing from everybody in this community. Outstanding. Well, I think we're uh, we're about at the end of our session. Um, there were a couple other comments. Maybe I'll use those as some closing remarks. Um, I, th I think you've all done a really great job of uh, describing Tract and describing that it's a uh, it's new. As Ari said, is this is a work in progress. And um, uh, I, you know, as we've as, we, as we've said, uh, Creative Commons is happy to engage with Tract and talked about some of the questions that you had. So Ari, please reach out to me. Um, and there were a couple of uh, comments um, about uh, the openness, right? So part of what uh, Creative Commons is looking at for its next 20 years is not just sharing, but better sharing. And uh, there were a few comments about um, finding ways uh, to make uh, what these uh, students and teachers are creating in Tract uh, available uh, openly. Um, so that uh, so that information can flow in and out and we start to engage a, a broader swath of learning. I think there's a lot of interest in what you're all doing and the uh, some of the comments that are coming in are pushing uh, your good work to expand uh, beyond just uh, maybe the, the group that you're working with to a wider audience. So that's exciting. We, we love it, Cable. We're really excited to spread and to share. And so thank you so much and we'll be in touch. <laughs> That uh, sounds great. Well, thanks everybody for coming today. Just a quick uh, plug, if you're interested in open education uh, in almost just about an hour's time, the open education platform uh, will be meeting. You're all welcome to come. You don't have to be a member. We're happy to sign you up. It's all free. Uh, and this is a group uh, of, for, of geez, 1,100 people from over 90 countries around the world that come together and work on uh, open education topics that are global in nature. So if that's of interest to you, please do join us. It's on the on the schedule for the summit. So with that, have, let me, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So if you have any creators in your community that you think might be interested in being a creator for track, just go to create.track.app and we'd be delighted to help them get started. Thanks, Esther. And let me thank all of our panelists for a great session. Have a good summit, everybody.